Welcome back to Medical Engineering. So today we want to talk about nuclear medicine and functional imaging. And in particular, we want to see how we can use tracers to actually create images of the metabolism inside the body. Therefore, we will have a short excursion into basics of radiation and how radiation can also be constructed into radioactive molecules. And these molecules will be used in order to create the image contrasts here. So looking forward to be introducing some nuclear medicine to you guys. Okay, nuclear medicine. What do we have to talk about? Well, let's introduce the topic. And there is a very interesting question that came up in the early 1900s. So here, George de Hisi used radioactive tracers in order to figure out whether there is actually metabolism in the bones or not. So the interesting thing is, up to that point in time, people weren't sure whether the bones are just like stiff parts inside of the body or whether they are also doing any kind of metabolism. So the bones are hard and dense and it wasn't clear whether there is actually something useful happening inside. And this could be shown with tracers. So George de Hisi injected radioactive phosphorus into rats and found that it accumulated in the bones. So with this experiment, he was the first to show that bones are actually living and that it can also saturate with something that you inject into an animal and that they accumulate in the bones. And this gave rise essentially to the tracer principle. And the tracer principle is that you take a radioactive isotope put it into the metabolism and then you measure its distribution. And this is the core idea of nuclear imaging. So here we are talking about functional imaging and you see that the nuclear kind of imaging devices, PET and SPECT, they measure metabolism and they have a rather coarse spatial resolution, but they're able to actually measure picomole. So very, very fine amounts of tracer can already be measured. And this is also very important because we want to be able to only use a minimum of radioactive tracers inside the body, because of course, this is also ionizing. It can break down the DNA strands and therefore it may also introduce cancer. So we want to be very careful with that. So we do that and the functional imaging is then using some isotope that is somehow inserted into the body. It can be injected, it can be swallowed, it can be breathed. So some way how to get it into the body. So it's injectional, oral or inhalation. And then the isotope's distribution is somehow going into the body either by perfusion or metabolism. And the goal of nuclear imaging is to reconstruct the activity distribution of the tracer in three dimensions and in time. So we have now four dimensional images and we want to figure out where actually the distribution is going and how it's being processed inside of the body. And we can use that to investigate the metabolism. Let's have a look at the physical foundations. In order to understand the following, we have to look a bit into the nuclear physics and in particular into isotopes. We know that the number of positrons in the actual core determines the actual element, but we can have different types of elements. So all of this is hydrogen, but you can have hydrogen with an additional neutron or with two additional neutrons. And these are essentially the different variants of hydrogen. And some of these isotopes are actually radioactive and they kind of 
disintegrate and by doing so they go into nuclear decay. So they cause radiation and this radiation in our case is the kind of effect that we want to use in order to figure out where the isotope is going. In order to figure out the metabolism, we just don't use the individual isotopes, but what we often do is we bind them into a specific molecule, and this molecule is then relevant for the actual metabolism. So, for example, sugar or other molecules that are a relevant role in our body's metabolism, and then we can figure out where the isotopes are actually going, and we can see the distribution also in a three or four dimensional image. So that's the key idea. Now there's of course a little more to that. So first of all we have radioactive decay and there are a couple of decay mechanisms and that depends on the kind of isotope that you're using. So there's alpha or beta decay, there is electron captures, there's isomere transition and spontaneous fission that can occur, but we're only actually interested in the ionizing radiation here and there's different kinds of decays that can happen so we can have a pure gamma that is produced so this is gamma radiation and this is essentially a photon that is emerging and then there is also the beta minus and beta plus decay and the beta plus is a positron and positrons are also very relevant for us because they can also be used for the tracer principle. So both of them are used for diagnostics. The beta minus and also alpha radiation is actually used for therapy. So there's also therapies where you use the ionizing radiation that is caused during radioactive decay. But here we mainly focus on the diagnostic applications. And this means we're interested in gamma decay and in beta plus positron decay. Now if you have such an isotope it will follow the decay law and here you see this is essentially the number of radionuclides at the initial time T0 so this is S0 and the number of radionuclides that still are present in the body can be determined by such an exponential decay law and here we have lambda this is the decay constant and from lambda we can compute the half-life and half-life is essentially the time the logarithm of 2 divided by lambda and this gives us the half-life so this is the amount of time that needs to pass that you have half of the amount of radionuclides still present so how does this look then like well actually there's a couple more things we need to talk about. One thing is activity. Activity is the number of decays per time frame. So activity is associated, but it's essentially the derivative of the radionuclides with respect to time. And you can compute the activity here with this equation. And typical unit is Becquerel. Becquerel are decays per second, and this is measured in BQ. There's also a former unit that still is used in the US. And in the US, you measure Curie, and Curie are abbreviated with CI, and one CI is 3.7 times 10 to the power of 10 Becquerel. And Becquerel is also something that you can measure with a Geiger counter. So this is a device that allows you to measure how many radioactive decays are happening in your environment. And this is exactly also what we are kind of afraid of when we are talking about nuclear power and so on. And there we measure the activity, the radioactivity. And in our case, we want to use the radioactivity actually to figure out how the metabolism is working inside of our patient. Typical activity a nuclear medicine is 100 to 1000 mega becquerel and in therapy you have 1 to 7 giga becquerel. So these are the numbers you should have in mind when you talk about these things. Now what's relevant now is that we talk about the activity. This is the amount and type of radioactivity used. The time is the duration of the exposure to a radioactive source. 
The distance is very important because the distance between the radioactive source and the critical organ or person is relevant because you have the inverse squared distance law. So the farther you are apart, the less the respective source is actually interacting with the tissues. And then there is also shielding. So you can introduce a medium between the radioactive source and the person or the critical organ. And this can also help you to prevent the radiation going to the locations where you don't want to have them. Good. So the problem statement in emission tomography is that we want to reconstruct the distribution of the activity. And a key problem is that in emission tomography, the source is inside the body and we can't just turn it off. So in x-rays, I turn off the x-ray tube and x-rays are gone. In emission tomography, all of the activity is already inside the patient and the patient itself is irradiating the radiation. So you also have to be very careful when you move those patients after diagnostics because they irradiate the radiation themselves. So they have to stay in hospital until they are no longer radioactive. And obviously there's the half-life that is relevant. And the other thing that's relevant is that there's also natural means how the tracer can leave the body, for example, through the bladder. So this is also something that you can use in order to figure out whether a patient is still radioactive or not. So to limit the radiation dose to a patient, there's very little or relatively little activity injected because we want to use it only for diagnose. So this is also why we have to work with this very little amounts of radioactivity and then reconstruct them. Technically, we get very low photon numbers and this means their statistics and the physical process must be considered. So you've seen that the Poisson distribution is different from a Gaussian distribution with low count numbers. And this will be very relevant also for this chapter. So typically the distribution that we want to reconstruct is the result of a Poisson process. And this is essentially the activity from all of the voxels that contribute to our detector element. So this is how we can describe this. A essentially describes how all of the voxels interact with our detector element. So we, again, we have something like a system matrix that describes the image formation process. So the goal of emission tomography is to reconstruct the activity distribution from the noisy projection data D using knowledge about the system geometry. So this is what we actually want to do. So one thing that we have to keep in mind is that our activity decays over time. And now you see that after six hours, I only have half of the activity after 12 hours, again, half 18 hours. So we have a six hour half life here. So we see this exponential decay happening. And this is also very relevant for the image quality. So if I image at T zero, then I have very little noise. But if I would image, let's say six hours later, or if I measure like 12 hours later, you see how the noise increases. So the more I wait, the more the noise increases because that is really dependent on the activity and the half-life that actually is used in this exponential process. So the image noise increases notably here in this case. And this is also something we have to keep in mind. Now let's talk a bit about the image formation. So first of all, we have to somehow get photons that we measure. Then the photons are projected somehow onto a detector. Then we use some tricks to figure out 
which of the photons are actually the relevant ones. This is called scintillation. Then we amplify. This is done with photomultiplier tubes, PMTs. And then we get essentially a light signal. And finally, we do some signal processing in order to get the reconstructed image. So this is the main outline of the image formation chain. Now, if we want to do that, we have to start with the actual photon emission. And there is two effects. We've seen that there is the gamma emission. So this is already producing some radiation. And there's a radioactive decay. And then the photon goes into an arbitrary direction. This is called single photon emission computed tomography SPECT. There's another kind of radiation source that we can use. And this is the beta plus decay, the positron. And this leads then to positron emission tomography PET. The key difference between the two is that in PET, we have a positron that interacts with an electron and they annihilate. They just disappear, but they didn't disappear without trace. They actually create two gamma and these gamma quanta, they are flying out in opposite directions. And both of them have exactly 511 kilo electron volts. So you get two gamma quanta that are exactly emitted into opposing direction. And this is nice because this forms a line. So in PET, we can use the coincidence detection to figure out which of the two gamma quanta actually are from the same event. And if we figure out that this is the same event, we can get the line that connects the two quanta and then from the joint attenuation, I can figure out how much attenuation was applied on this line. So this is nice. And this gives us some advantages for PET reconstruction, because we have some advantage in terms of knowledge about the geometry. Now let's go ahead and put this to use. So one thing that we now have to do is we have to scintillate. So we have somehow have to produce a measurable signal from our gamma quanta. It doesn't matter whether it's now PET or SPECT. We have somehow have to measure the gamma quanta. And this is done with scintillation material. And there is a typical number of scintillators. So there's sodium iodine. There is BGO, which is uh, bismuth, germanium, and oxide. And there is LSO, which is lutetium, silicon, oxide. So these kind of scintillators are very common. They differ by density. So you see the last two are similar in density. They differ by effective atomic number. They also have a different light yield. And then they are also used essentially in different imaging systems. So in SPECT, you typically have the sodium iodine scintillators. And these two here are mostly used in PET. So there you see already the difference in the construction of the system. So you need different detectors and different scintillators, depending on the kind of radiation that you have. So already there we have differences. Now let's talk about a SPECT detector. So with SPECT, we have the huge problem that we don't know where the gamma quanta is originating from. And we see that we use here something that is called a collimator. And it has a very similar idea as the anti-scatter grid that we've seen in x-rays. So if I have some event that originates from here, then you can see that essentially if I connect it directly here, I will get a high response. But if I'm essentially going into other directions, the collimator is able to block a lot of the radiation that doesn't hit directly the detector. So here these photons all get absorbed. And this then results in a point spread function that is a little sharper than if we are not using a collimator. So this 
essentially is a technique that helps us in building better point spread functions on the detector, in particular for the case of spread. Now, if we want to use that, we can essentially measure a point spread function. And here you see a hexagonal collimator design, and you see that most of the point spread function is here, but we still get these kind of leaves, and this is exactly perpendicular to the collimator blades that have been constructed. So here you see the design. This is a collimator with parallel holes. So the holes are just not narrowing down. And here you can the, see the schematic. So you see all of the different scattering events coming in here and only the ones that are actually in the orientation of our parallel collimator holes will be detected in the end. And this allows us to differentiate all of these scattering events and we are only seeing things that come from a particular direction. And of course, this is key to enable the actual reconstruction. So here you see this is a one cent coin and this is the size of the collimator grid that is constructed. Now, if we look a bit more into the characteristics, we see that there is essentially a trade-off with the diameter of the hole, the length, here of the collimator blades and then the distance into the scene. And all of this allows us to determine essentially a point spread function. And we measure the sharpness of this point spread function by the full width at half maximum. So this allows us to give us the properties of a specific point spread function. And here you can see that we are able to compute a certain r so r is essentially the distance of the slope here and r is determined as d over l times z plus l over 2. so d is the aperture l is the bore length and z is the source to collimator distance and this way we are able to determine all of these parameters here very well this gives us actually a kind of path where we can design collimators, so increasing the bore length or decreasing the bore increases its resolution, but it also decreases the efficiency, which means the number of photons that make it through the collimator. So we somehow have to have a design compromise when we're building these collimators. And then also we can build thicker scepter or blades. And the thick blades, of course, cause the different holes to be separated better, but they also reduce the efficiency because they also reduce the area of the individual holes. So if I have very thick scepter, then I also have less photons that actually get detected at the detector. This then brings us to a couple of configurations and I don't want to run all of this, but then there is different applications and they come up with different configurations here. And obviously, depending on the configuration here, I have a different weight. And you can see that the collimator can weigh between 22.1 kilograms up to 134 kilograms. So this is the high energy collimator here. And then there is the low energy all purpose collimator here. And there's also ultra high resolution kind of collimators and you can see configurations from them here. Very well, so this is the idea of the collimator. And now after the collimator, I actually need to detect something. And this is done with this photo multiplier tube array. And we essentially have a lead collimator. Then we have our scintillator that kind of produces the visible light. And then we need this array in order 
to construct the actual detector. And this leads to the following setup. So you have some event that goes here into the crystal and this is then running through the photomultiplier. This goes to a pre-amplifier, an integrator, impulse height analyzer, channel analyzer. And what we then get is we get a photon count and this is energy resolved. So that's pretty cool that in the PMT detectors we really get the spectrum. And now we can use actually the spectral information here that events that are in this energy range, they are primary. And all of the events that are here in this energy range, they are scatter. So scatter correction in SPECT is very easy because I can just say, okay, if it's below this threshold, it's scatter. If it's beyond this threshold, it must be primary radiation because it has a higher energy. So this is pretty cool. And because we essentially detect the individual events, we have very few photons, we can analyze them well and use that immediately for scatter correction and getting rid of scattered signals. So this is an additional scatter prevention that we can use on top of the thick septa. So this then brings us to a first image formation process. So here you see the detector and the collimator, and then you have a patient here, and the patient irradiates into our detector, and here the images are being made. If you see then the images, what you can get out of this are these planar scintigraphy. Typically we take two of these detectors and then we move along the patient. And you can see because of the absorption inside of the body, there is actually a front and a back image. So the front and back image is different because the body itself also absorbs some of the radiation and the two detectors measure two different signals. Here you see then that you can also measure from the side or you can also measure from the front. So yeah, what's the difference between emission tomography and CT? Well, there's a little bit of difference because you have essentially no X-ray source, but you have the event emitted somewhere inside the body. So you have some kind of activity that is distributed in here it's only a slice but it could also be a volume and then you have the contribution of this activity summed up and this gives the projection so in terms of the kind of math it's similar because it's the same basic process but of course we have to know from which directions the actual contributions are because if everything is just contributing, then just everything is connected with everything and we can't solve. So we need to use a collimator in order to bring up a proper kind of system matrix. And with this, we can then reconstruct the activity. In contrast, in a CT system, you always get complete line integrals and these are completely measured. So here we always observe everything that is integrated along this line. So it has different projection properties and this results in a different system matrix and a different point spread function. And obviously the signal statistics are different. But other than that, the reconstruction is to some degree similar. So let's look a bit into the geometry of PET. In PET you have this event, then you have the two gamma quanta that are fired out, and then they get detected in the ring shape detector here and here. And then you have a very fast kind of electronics, and this electronics is detecting coincident events. And if you have a coincident event, then you know that this ray has been used for this particular decay, and that you can associate this particular measurement to this geometry here. So we can kind of get a list of events and the list of events is associated to the particular geometry in our PET system. Then we need to reconstruct somehow. We do it in a similar way as we've observed it before. We do an objective function and then we optimize it. So we somehow describe the mismatch between the current estimation of the activity and volume and what we actually measured. And if we're able to describe the mismatch, then we can optimize the activation 
in our model such that it matches the actual observations. And this is the reconstruction that is done here, and this is a classical iterative reconstruction approach. So what we need to do is we need to describe somehow how the activity in volume and the detector are actually associated. And if I had only a single volume element and a single detector, the system matrix would simply be an element with a one. So we would directly observe the activity as it's happening in our volume. Unfortunately, that's not entirely true but instead we have some kind of geometry and this makes it a little more complicated because all of the voxel elements they somehow contribute to the respective detector elements and so on so they are interconnected and the geometry now governs the configuration of the system matrix if i use for example a parallel kind of collimator inspect then this essentially drives this kind of system matrix. And if I have the different rays connecting each other in a PET system, then this drives again the system matrix here. In order to describe the image formation, we can express this essentially as a probability of observing the current reading at the detector given the current estimate of the activity distribution. And this can then be written up as this term here. So you see that we have the Poisson distribution in here, then a product over all the elements and in the end a sum over Q. And this gives us essentially the model that we can then link to each other. And then we do a maximum likelihood reconstruction. So we seek to optimize the likelihood of this term. And we do that with respect to the current activity. So this then yields an iterative procedure that allows us to update the respective volume such that we get an activity that explains best the actual observations that we got from the detector. And this is nice because we can put directly the statistics into this model and the Poisson model and so on. So if we want to construct then the objective function, we then have to set up the previous equation, we initialize with some estimate, we project this estimate to the detector using our model, then we compute essentially the difference by computing the fraction of the two and back project this in order to update our activity and we repeat all of this until we get an acceptable image quality. So this is approximately how the iterative image reconstruction in emission tomography works. It's in fact a little bit more complicated because we have these many different things that actually take part in the image formation. So if you have the true activity distribution, there is, the scans take quite long, so there's motion on top, there's the partial volume effect, there's scattering happening, and then there is the attenuation of the tissues that are actually in the patient that also causes signal loss. And this is the actual observation. So if we want to reconstruct the entire thing, we step by step correct for the attenuation differences, we remove the scatter, we do a partial volume correction, and then we do a motion correction. And this then gives us a measured count distribution in terms of a volume. And if you are able to calibrate this, let's say there is a source of known activity in the field of view, then you can really get a measured activity distribution. So then you have a calibrated quantitative kind of scanning procedure. Now, the actual reconstruction then often looks like this. So you acquire a CT data set and the CT data set is relevant because it tells us how much the body actually attenuates. So it will tell us the topology of the body and where we would lose more gamma quanta when they pass through this part of the body. So we need a CT scan and this gives us attenuation correction map. And this is a mapping here because typically we have a different kind of acceleration voltage in the CT scan than the gamma quanta that we have in the PET or SPECT scan. So they have to be calibrated to be in the same energy range. And then we get an attenuation map that tells us where we are more likely to lose photons. Then we have the spec data. 
and from this we can start an initialization so we start then with a first initial guess forward project this volume get an estimate of the projection compare this to the actual projection data then we estimate the error this error is going to be back propagated so we update the activity in the volume this gives us new volume estimate which we forward project and then we get essentially this loop and we iterate until convergence until there are only small changes or a fixed number of iterations is reached and this gives us then the final image reconstruction let's have a look at different reconstruction results and what you have to keep in mind is that you have some emission data then you have the CT scan you see the resolution of the CT scan here is much finer so you see that it has a very very fine resolution and this is used to produce this kind of correction map or correction matrix and this is also called mu map and you see that we have to reduce the resolution of course and we have to adjust the attenuation coefficients because they are different in different energy ranges but this can be done with a linear estimate so it's not that difficult if you already have the CT scan now if you do that then you can do two different kinds of reconstructions and here we are comparing a reconstruction without attenuation correction and with attenuation correction and you see very clearly if you don't correct for the attenuation you get this kind of copying artifact and if you do perform attenuation correction using a mu map you get a very homogeneous intensity and obviously this is a cylinder of constant activity so we would like to reconstruct a flat plateau like this one and what you see here is actually the intensities along this line here yeah so this is what the attenuation correction does and then we can also look at an advanced principle and this is called the time of flight principle in PET and there are very very fast coincident detectors and they're not just able to detect which events actually happen at the same time but they're even better they can detect the time shift between the two events and this allows us to locate the event not just to a certain ray but also to a certain depth so from a single time of flight measurement I don't just get the actual activity but I also get a depth estimate so from a single projection that I synthesize from a number of elements on a certain direction I can reconstruct the back projection that is already resolved with respect to depth and then I can do that for multiple kind of directions and in contrast to what we would see in a classical back projection where everything is just smeared across this direction we can get a very much improved resolution characteristic for PET images so this time of flight imaging is a very nice tool to detect where actually on the ray connecting the two detector elements the event has happened and I can supply it with an additional depth direction so that's pretty cool so we can get much sharper images using time of flight technology now we want to use that for clinical questions and what is typically being investigated is in oncology you localize tumors you can also localize metastases you can quantify tumor growth you can search for metastases and you can use it for therapy control in neurology you can diagnose epilepsy alzheimer and stroke in cardiology you can check the perfusion and metabolism of the heart and detect ischemic region infarcts and the vitality of the heart in general and also in pharmacology research you can essentially assess the functional parameters of pharmaceuticals and how they change the metabolism so this is also a very relevant kind of research where PET inspect imaging is being used now here I have a couple of interesting overlays so this is an MRI image and here you see a kind of PET image 
and this pet image now shows essentially different information and I can fuse them. So I can bring them into the same coordinate system and then I can see with a structural background that actually uh, this kind of activity is associated to this brain area. And here I know the brain areas very well. In this image, it's very hard to differentiate the brain areas. So the joint use of two modalities brings us much better localization properties with the nuclear imaging scans. So most of the scanners that are used today, they're actually hybrids. So there's either the PET-CT or the PET-MR. So you can associate the scanners with different other modalities in order to get the additional localization information. And this is the workload of the scanners. They are often hybrid systems. So here are some cardiac applications. And you can see here that the myocardium can be imaged with scanners and these are different scanners from Siemens Healthineers and you can also see the kind of distribution of the tracer in the heart muscle and then if you see that there are areas where the tracer is actually not going very well then this is typically an infarct area where there is not enough blood supply and therefore also the heart is malfunctioning. So that's a very popular technique to assess the heart. Obviously, there is also some dose burden associated with different kind of diagnosis. And here you see, for example, in the thyroid, you have a certain activity in megabecquerel. Then you can also determine a critical organ dose and, for example, the associated activity in other organs. And obviously, if you move closer towards that specific other organ, then the dose burden also increases. So what's very classical, if you do such a scan, and in particular also if you plan therapy, then you segment the organs and you try to predict how much dose will actually go into other organs. And then you can use that in order to adjust the amount of therapeutics that are being used in order to fight, for example, a cancer or so on. Very well. Let's continue and talk a little bit about hybrid imaging. So I already said that most of these systems are hybrids today and in SPECT you very often have combinations with CT. So you see this is the SPECT camera and this is actually the CT system. So this is a CT gantry, this donut, and you can image CT and SPECT at the same time. So the way of how this is being done is you put the patient on the table, then you do a 20 minute SPECT scan, and then you can do a, a helical or spiral CT by moving the patient here. So you see this is the CT gantry, and this is the SPECT gantry, and then you don't have to move the patient. The patient remains in the same position, and therefore then you have two scans that you can overlay very well. I mean, this is very important if you image the abdomen, because if you have the patient stand up and sit down again and all the organs shift around and this would make the retrospective registration of the two scans very difficult. So you want to have the patient actually lying on the same bed when you do those two scans. Obviously there's also breathing on top so you still may want to register the motion and compensate the motion between the scans but this can actually be done on top with these hybrid systems. Another alternative is PET-CT. So here you have a PET ring and a CT gantry that are just in the same kind of donut. And then there is also 
the pet mr and this is now a very long system so you have a pet ring and an entire mri machine here and this system can simultaneously acquire mri and pet and this is also very cool because the mri scans can also take rather long but you can image long protocols and also very frequently update motion parameters and things like that and this allows very accurate motion compensation in these systems so it's a very cool technique but one thing that you don't get from mri is the mu maps you don't get the attenuation correction and this was a huge problem actually when they were designing these systems but it turns out that you can use ultra short echo sequences so you actually have a set of four sequences the dixon water dixon fat and then different ultra short sequences and with that you train a machine learning algorithm and you train it in a way that it predicts the ct image so already when the first pet mr scanners were introduced they were shipped with machine learning that would predict the attenuation maps from different mri sequences so that's pretty cool and we've seen that the world of medical imaging and machine learning they are closely related together and actually the algorithm that has been used in the pet mr scanner that has been manufactured first this kind of system actually had an algorithm that was co-developed at our lab as well so that's a pretty cool development and we see that these algorithms are really crucial if you want to actually build sophisticated systems that are able to do attenuation and correction. And it's also pretty nice that actually the absorption that we have in CT is very different from the MRI signal. Still, we can use the similarities in anatomy and the location of the image patches to predict reasonable mu maps. So that's actually pretty cool. So we can predict something that we never physically measured just by using the prior knowledge about anatomy and how patients actually typically look like to get a course estimate that is good enough to get a attenuation correction that is very, very close to really using the original CT values. So that's also a very nice result. And this essentially enabled using also MR scanners in hybrid PET installations. So this already brings us to the end of this video. So you've seen now the principles of nuclear imaging and how we can use tracers. They get essentially connected to certain molecules that are important for the metabolism. And then I can watch over time where the tracer is going and analyze the function the metabolism of the body and with that we are then able to analyze specific disease we've seen that we can use that for cancer but also for brain diseases for alzheimer's and also for diseases in the heart so this is a very important technology that allows us to assess how well the function of the body actually works and we can do that entirely non-invasively well there is a certain dose burden but if you look at the types of disease that we have, they typically appear in elderly persons. And therefore, there is only little tracer being used. And also, if you already suffer from cancer, the risk of developing a cancer in 10 or 15 years from the treatment may not be as acute as the actual cancer that is currently growing in your body. So these kind of technologies help us to improve the care of the patient, the treatment, and we've seen that we can use them also for diagnosing severe disease and for planning the respective treatment. So I hope you enjoyed this video and this small excursion into functional imaging. This already ends everything that we talk about functional imaging here. And instead, we want to look into the next modality in the next video. And this is going to be ultrasound. So thank you very much for watching and looking forward to seeing you in the next video. Bye bye.